Howdy all, I'm Adam the Renaissance Nerd. The acolyte is over. We live in a post-acolyte world now, and some of us, well, we feel a whole lot better now that it's over and we don't have to cover it anymore. But some people out there, they live in a fantasy world. They think that this was some sort of gigantic success, that Leslie Headland is a magnificent creator. She had a vision. We let her cook, and she gave us such a glorious meal, when in fact, Leslie Headland understands nothing about Star Wars, and if you delve into her final interview, or one of them, I guess, or maybe there's a few out there, but she talked to Collider. She talked to Maggie Lovett. Remember Maggie Lovett, who complained after the Kiati Mundi incident with Wikipedia that she received so many threats and this and that, but never showed a single receipt? That Maggie Lovett? Well, anyway, Leslie Headland talked to her again in a very lengthy article on Collider, and when we look at this article, now we're not going to look at the whole thing. It's long, it's boring, it's stupid. We're going to pull out a couple of things right now. We'll come back to the whole thing on a later stream. But there are some moments here we're going to look at that show you that Leslie Headland is uncreative. She's a very disturbed individual with her perceptions on family and fathers and daughters and character work. And also, she really does live in a world where she believes her own delusions of grandeur, that she thinks she's put out this incredible piece of work that is better than real Star Wars made by George Lucas and more talented creators. Anyway, so let's get right to it. I'm going to go over a couple of things here. And as I said, at a later date, on stream most likely, we will delve deeper into this horrendous article. So Leslie, what do you have to tell us? I am the type of Star Wars fan that doesn't even have a favorite movie. I just want to live in the universe of Star Wars continually in perpetuity forever. So when people are like, what's your, what's your favorite Star Wars movie? I'm like, there is no Star Wars movie. There is only Star Wars. We begin with this, that Leslie Headland has a very strange understanding of what you should be putting on screen. Star Wars is about the fight between good against evil. Jedi versus Sith. Very simple story. Very easy to understand if you're not a warped, demented, deranged individual. Leslie Hedlund, however, wanted to give us a story where the Sith are the good guys, where the Jedi are the bad guys, and the Sith are just an oppressed minority who need to live free from the Jedi so they can do what they want, because guess what? It's okay to be murderers. Anyway, but we're talking about now Manny Jacinto who was the stranger, which is something they want to call him, but everybody else makes up their own names for him. I call him Darth Zipperface. Anyway, we have Darth Zipperface and how he's supposed to be in the story, and they're talking about how they created the character and how they chose many, and there's two very, very big problems with this. One, let's read what she has to say, talking about creating the character. One of your scent. The character, he being the stranger, Darth Zipperface, he has to be a witness to what she finds out about herself. That being, he has to be in the moment where Osha, played by a man with Stenberg, decides to bleed a crystal and vader herself into being a full-on bad guy, which we're supposed to be sympathetic to, even though she's now murdering people left and right. It was a very important that she had her own agency and that she made this decision independently of him. But I agree, him witnessing it draws them together and so much more. So it went buffoon, terrifying villain, seductive possible teacher, and then romantic lead. So I had to find somebody who could play all four characters. Buffoon, murderer, a gentle teacher, and then a romantic lead. We stop right there. We'll get to the next half of this in a second. This is what they were thinking of. Not, let's have a story about bad guys doing bad things. Let's create a character to be our villain who can be a romantic lead. Just for a moment here, here's what happens in this show. He abducts her, her being Osha. He starts to tell her that she needs to give in to her negative emotions to use the Force again. Then... He leads her down the merry path of, oh, I'm going to go take a bath, look at my dick while I get out. And in a matter of an hour or two, he has seduced her, and she is now dependent on him. But then again, she flips the table, and he has to be dependent on her in order to get from point A to point B, so then that she can make her full evolution into a Sith. This is their relationship. Very abusive, very demented, very deranged. And this is Leslie Headland's idea of a romance. 
But this is what we're talking about here. Leslie Headland doesn't understand what a real romance is. To her, romance is dysfunction. And that's sick and wrong, but there are plenty of stands out there who are happy to finger themselves to it and think that this is healthy. Also forgetting the fact that every Sith apprentice will end up killing their master. They, they honestly think that Osha and Darth Zipperface are going to have some sort of epic romance that's going to be one for the ages. If, even in, in Disney Star Wars, she's a Sith. He's her Sith master. She will gank him eventually. They don't get it, though. All they want to do is go, mm, and feel good about it later. But it gets worse because she also thinks that <laughs> she thinks that these lightsaber duels in this show truly do equal that of George Lucas' Star Wars prequel trilogy. Leading up to, during, and now after this horrible series, Leslie Headland and her band of moronic minions have been trying to tell you, me, and everybody that they had the bestest ever lightsaber duels, even better than the prequel trilogy, when in fact, if you look at them closely, the choreography is dog shit. I showed it to you. I broke it down in my review and later on in a separate clip how they do not even measure up in both physical quality and emotional quality to the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy. But Leslie Headland is still going to tell you that these are the greatest ever with someone like Maggie Lovett licking her up and down telling her you're the greatest in the world. But talking about the finale, I want to know about the process of outdoing yourself every time. That's what made these fight sequences so impressive. Headland, second union director Chris Cohen and I, we were shooting for immortality. We were like, are we effing going for it? We want to top duel the fates well you didn't and i already showed you that you didn't we want to top the train station in the matrix we will settle for nothing else i will leave it up to the viewer as to whether or not we achieved that but in my heart of hearts i was like we achieved that as far as i'm concerned but you didn't you didn't over and over again it was literally running around frenetic chaos or swinging sticks just to hit each other. There are moments in the final duel, the epic final duel between Darth Zipper Face and Master Squid Game where they are literally moving the sabers just to hit each other, whether it's up or down, whether it's literally pushing the sabers into a lock block rather than ending up there organically and somehow then reversing it and in a weird tug of war back and forth. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. And then it culminates in... I'm flying down as I crouching tiger hidden dragon on top of you saying, oh, it fits perfectly because if anyone could do it, two force users can float. No, it doesn't work. It looks ridiculous. It looks stupid. And anybody with a logical trained eye can see it. But these people live in a fantasy world, as are the stands who support this. They think it's the greatest thing ever. They think everything after 2012 is real Star Wars and everything before needs to be pushed aside into the gutter. Leslie Headland and those around her do not understand what good choreography looks like. They think you just swing the sticks and you hit it. And they truly believe to this moment. This is after it's all said and done. They think they've made something better than Duel of the Fates, better than the Battle of Heroes, when in fact they have failed completely. But the failure doesn't end here. There is now an even deeper level of degeneracy when you hear what Leslie Headland thinks a father-daughter relationship is like. Leslie Headland claims that the father-daughter relationship between Saul and Osha is one of the core important aspects of the entire series. But here's her definition of a father-daughter relationship. Talking about Saul and Osha, we also knew it was always going to be the betrayal of the father. And I knew we had to juxtapose Luke's forgiveness and Vader's redemption. We're like, this is a story about the Sith, so that's not going to happen. You're absolutely right. There's this thing that's called benign sexism. The f 
And part of it is this paternal protectionism. It seems like this good thing, but like you said, there's this, I have to protect you from everything. I have to make sure you're okay. I have to tell you what track to get on. And then once you're on that track, I need to support you. Wow, that's almost like being a good dad is an important thing. But Leslie Headland doesn't believe in good dads. Ultimately, what happens is, again, this is a father-daughter relationship. As women evolve in their lives and develop their own personalities separate from their fathers, at some point, they have to reject that protectionism. Reject the good dad that spent his life making sure you grew up safe, sound, and sane. Again, I'm so proud of it. I have so many favorite moments in the show. I have like 100, and I'm happy to go through all of them right now. One of my favorite moments is when she he says, I did everything because I love, he's going to say I love you, and not only is that a level of attachment that an unbalanced Jedi would have. Oh, we have to remind you, Saul's a bad Jedi. They specifically wrote a broken poor Jedi so that you can frame the Jedi as emotionally unstable. They can't control their emotions. That's the point of this story. But you drive it home with suddenly turning what's supposed to be a good dad type of thing into a bad dad type of thing. Hey, he very clearly is losing in that last half of the season, but that's also the justification for that kind of behavior between the father and the daughter. The daughter has to surpass him in some way. She cannot stay a little girl or an adolescent or young adult. She has to at some point say, I reject what you have told me I need to do to make you proud to follow in your footsteps. She has to do that. Reject the good dad who protected you. Reject the good dad who provided to you. This is Leslie Headland. This is the story she's writing. The betrayal they're so talking about is what Saul did when he killed black mama lesbian. He saw a woman transforming into a giant dark force smoke apparition and seemingly attacking a little girl. What would you do in that situation? Protect the little girl. But the Jedi are bad, and you have to reject good dads, everybody. A good dad is bad. We have to tell a Sith story where there is no redemption, there's only hate. No, this is you saying good dads are bad, reject your good dad, embrace your queerness. That's what this is, and it doesn't stop there, because remember, Leslie Headland said, I make this show as a queer woman. I make this show as Kill Bill plus Frozen. How about it's Kill Bill plus Frozen and every other goddamn thing under the sky because that's all Leslie Heller can do. Copy and paste what other people did and then claim it's art. Um, when I saw Frozen as a, as a grown-ass woman, I, um, I cried through the entire movie. Uh, there was just something about the relationship between the sisters, the, the like, de-villainization of uh, the classic kind of fairy tale bad bad guy, you know, um, uh, the concept of true love being between two sisters and not a heterosexual relationship. Like it just, mm -hmm. it just destroyed me completely. And I thought, gosh, you know, I would love to make something like this. That is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, Disney, meaning it's something that like my parents would have allowed me to see when I was younger as a queer person, gotcha. but I would have been able to understand as a queer person. And I think I, I would have had a completely different life. And so I really was inspired by it and was like, God, I would love to make a story like this. Leslie Headland doesn't have an original creative bone in her body. It is fair game to say that George Lucas, he was inspired by so many things when he created Star Wars. There's a difference between being inspired and flat out copying shit because you think it looks cool. When asked by Maggie Lovett, I love all the different influences that you have talked about throughout these three interviews that we've gotten to do, like Crimson Peak and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Are there any other visual or storytelling images that you had when creating this? There's something I personally love when you see the fingerprints of different stories. Headland, yes! Shirichiro Watanabe, he's the creator of Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo. These were... Big references, not visually, but tonally. Especially Cowboy Bebop bounces back and forth between Spike's backstory, which is incredibly tragic and heart-wrenching. And then this fun buoyancy when they do episodic episodes. He feels like a Han Solo coded character. So totally, those were references. This is Leslie Headland. 
I'm going to grab random thing that people love and say, I love it too. Therefore, I'm going to copy and paste it. So now you're a weeb. Now you're into anime too. And let's be honest, all these things are not Star Wars. Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo are not Star Wars. You should not be totally referencing them in Star Wars. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, using the super wire kung fu crap that they did in that, is great in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Didn't work here. Didn't work at all. I don't know what Crimson Peak is, but it's probably shit too, because guess what? Leslie Headland doesn't understand what works in Star Wars. She's a disaster. She has no originality, no creativity. All she can do is copy and paste what others did and then claim this is how it works, not understanding that you can't just take something you like and jam it into an existing franchise. That's the problem. This entire show, all eight episodes, it's a hodgepodge of different ideas that Leslie Headland thinks people think are cool or she thinks is cool. And then she tries to push it all together. Let's run down the list again. Frozen, Kill Bill, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, now Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo. What else are you going to throw in there? 50 Shades of Grey because you did that too. Abusive relationships, crap choreography, bad dialogue, bad writing, trying to implement ideas, thoughts, and feelings that shouldn't be implemented in a story taking place in Star Wars. This whole show was a disaster. There is no saving grace to it. It is not George Lucas Star Wars, and they actively take the time to destroy it at every turn. And here we are, it's done, it's over, and Leslie Headland is pushing damage control to try and explain things away. I mean, there's a lot in this article that I had to skip over just to bring these few points to you. They want, you to let, they want to let you know in this that lightsabers are phallic symbols to them. They want to let you know that just because you didn't see something happen on screen doesn't mean there's not motivation for Basil suddenly decide, deciding to destroy the ship so that Saul can't capture May in their chase through space. It's so much lunacy that you it's hard to believe that it's real. But it is real. The Acolyte exists. It's a disaster. It's a failure. And it has been rejected. Will they get a season two? I don't know. This is 2024. Logically speaking, when somebody wastes $180 million, gets no return, nobody's really buying the merch, and all the rejection is out there for you to see when it doesn't even reach proper ratings on traditional rating scales, you would think it'll be canceled. But no, this is, as I said, 2024, where morons will just look to social media and the five or ten same people circle joking responses on something like X Twitter where all you see is trending not realizing that it's the same people just talking about it over and over again it doesn't mean success it just means they're talking about it and most of the time it's negative people rejecting garbage like this they'll just take that and go look investors it's trending give us money for season two so I have no idea. If it gets to season two, I'll be there. I'll roast it. And I'll make more money than Disney actually does. For now, I'm done. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, a like would be very much appreciated. If you are new here, I invite you to subscribe to me right here on YouTube, where I hope to earn your trust and support using facts and logic, because facts and logic do not care about Stan Fake Fan and SJW Fifi's. Thank you again for watching. Take it easy. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed the video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, check out my gaming channel at Renaissance Nerd Arcade, and follow me on X Twitter under at the Red Nerd. Thanks again for watching. Take it easy.